Hi everyone. Um, my name is Lydia and I'm here doing this orientation call with you. Nobody is actually on the call. I'm recording this asynchronously. So there's going to be a couple times when I sort of ask for your participation. So, you know, you can kind of think about that however you feel. So I'm going to start um, by just talking a little bit about why I'm involved in Extinction Rebellion and have been for the past year or so. Um, I do the vast majority of my work within the outreach working group. And so outreach is really just anything that has to do with interacting with the outside public. It's putting on events, it's flyering in the park, it's figuring out how to onboard people into the movement and integrate them into Extinction Rebellion. Um, a lot of what I do is in turnout and recruitment, which is sort of a subgroup of outreach, and that's really the fly ring. So um, I'm always at the park talking to people. Um, you may have seen me out there before. Maybe that's why you're here. I would love to know that if that's the case. Um, I really love thinking about how to get people from this point of passive support which is where a lot of people in New York City are, where they understand that climate change is happening. They really want to do something about it. Um, but they also maybe feel totally hopeless and dejected and like they can't do anything about it. I want to get them from that point to the place of active support where they are really dedicating their time and their energy, however much time and energy that is, to uh, making a difference and to putting their money where their mouth is really. So I really love thinking about that. That's like a, that's a, that's a fun puzzle for me. And so I really have found my home in outreach. Uh, I joined Extinction Rebellion at a time in my life when I had just quit my first job after college and I was really thinking a lot about the future. I had no idea what I wanted to do next, um, but I knew that I wanted to spend my time doing things that I cared about. Uh, and doing things that were helpful to people and weren't just me sort of sitting around unemployed reading in a coffee shop. The other thing that I wanted to do was escape this sort of sense of dread that I was feeling and I had been feeling for a really long time, especially in college um, when I was, you know, taking on a ton of debt and working really hard at school and, you know, was in the midst of a pandemic at some point. I was just constantly dogged by this sense of um, uncertainty about the future. And I was, I was 24 at the time that I joined Extinction Rebellion. And um, I think that a lot of people my age are in the same position as me where they feel that uncertainty. I know that I talk to my friends all the time about how we don't really feel like saving for retirement makes sense because who knows if we're gonna make it that long. Um, of friends who don't wanna have kids because they feel like that's unethical if their kids are gonna grow up in a world um, that where it's just you know climate change induced disaster after disaster and i really do feel like my future is going to look so different than the world that i grew up in and throughout college that really made me just sort of spiral all the time and i wanted to stop spiraling and um i thought that maybe one way to stop spiraling was to actually start doing something um and i was right uh at which you know i'll get to um but I joined Extinction Rebellion because the 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 method of nonviolent direct action really sort of fit with my values. I I want to be radical, but I don't want to hurt anyone. And then the longer I was in Extinction Rebellion, the more I really grew to um, support nonviolent direct action and learn about how effective it is. And the more I grew to find community in Extinction Rebellion, like now I just I really love the people who I work with on a day to day basis. Um, I look forward to organizing with them and um, and socializing with them, and I learn so much from everyone in this movement. And so I'm I'm really glad that I'm here. On a weekly basis, I spend anywhere between like three and a half to ten hours doing Extinction Rebellion stuff. Um, if I wanted to, I could do as little as one or two hours. Um, and 10 hours is really a pretty heavy week. That would be if we had a mobilization or a big action that I needed to help help be part of. Um, but my specific tasks are um, that I'm the internal coordinator of the outreach working group. And so I sort of make sure that everybody has tasks that they need to do. I make sure I, I understand what everybody's capacity is to do their work. I make sure that the different subgroups are communicating with each other and sort of keep an eye on the future, like make sure that we're planning ahead and doing what needs to get done in relation to other working groups as well. 
Um, I'm also the facilitator of our weekly Monday meetings, and I have a lot of fun doing that. I like, um, I don't know, I like making things into actionable items, and so that's really my main task as facilitator. Outside of Extinction Rebellion, I work at a nonprofit. I work in fundraising, and so a lot of the skills that I use at work, I also use at Extinction Rebellion. Um, with the difference that Extinction Rebellion, you know, I spend a little bit less time on my computer and a little bit more time out in the park handing flyers out to people, which is a very welcome change to me. So um, you're probably in one of two camps. You're probably either totally all in and ready to get going and maybe kind of bored by this call and you don't really feel like it could be any use to you um because you just want to get out on the streets and that's really that's pretty amazing and I'm, I'm really happy if that's you I'm also perfectly happy if you're in the other camp of why well, I don't really I know that I want to do something but I don't really know what and I don't totally understand what Extinction Rebellion stands for or what their strategy is what is in their DNA how are they different from all the other climate change organizations out there so I'll start by just talking a little bit about why we do this orientation call um so to give a little overview of what Extinction Rebellion looks like internally, there are a couple dozen people who regularly give their time and effort to Extinction Rebellion in New York. And then there are a couple hundred people who actually like show up to stuff here and there. They may go to an action, they may go to a march, they may go to a community gathering. So when people are joining XR, some come with very specific expectations about how to address climate change and what actions need to be taken. Others feel this really urgent need to do something, but they don't really know exactly what needs to be done. And they may not have a clear strategy in mind. They may not even recognize the importance of having a clear strategy. Um, and that's all completely fine. Extinction Rebellion strategy might not be immediately obvious to everyone. Our demands and our values, they're all available online, but they don't really provide the complete picture. We think that it's important to have this conversation, this orientation call first, before you start contributing to Extinction Rebellion, so you can align your needs and expectations with the, with our direction as a movement, and understand if those needs and expectations fit where we're going. There's also just a lot of ways for you to get involved in Extinction Rebellion, so hopefully this call will give you a sense of what those are. This is also just an opportunity for you to hear from someone who's part of the movement. And um, I know we're not actually live and in person right now, but um, you can pretty easily find my contact information and we'll get to that at the end. And I would always, I'm always happy to connect with you and answer any questions that you have. So, um, we are clearly not in person, so I won't be just asking you these questions um, and waiting for your response, but I will pose to you a couple of questions about yourself that you can think about as we're going forward. Are you part of the climate movement for the first time? Or have you been in other social movements before? Have you ever been involved in civil disobedience? Do you have any experience in communications and marketing? So think about all those things. Um, we really want you to be able to identify your skills and also to identify what you want out of this personally. Like, obviously we're working towards this broader goal, but um, we're also, we're part of a community and we all contribute the, in the way that we want to contribute. We're, we're a community of volunteers. And so think about like what exactly you have to give and what you want to give to this movement. And while you're thinking about that, we'll start talking about our demands. So then you can go from thinking about your own skills to thinking about your own values and whether or not these demands align with them. The first one is tell the truth. Um, we're really past the breaking point for the climate and ecological crisis, and our government is not delivering that message. It's, it's saying breaking point is kind of loaded because, you know, as much as we can avoid any sort of warming, the, the more warming we avoid, the more lives we'll save. But, but, we're, but we're past, you know, we've, we've gotten past benchmark after benchmark. And so imagine what would happen if Joe Biden went into the Rose Garden and said that, like said that we have passed benchmark after benchmark and we're past like the Pearl Harbor moment. What kind of energy would that unleash? Just the act of him telling the truth. Like what changes would that make possible? The government is pretending that there's no crisis when emissions are rising every year and the climate is changing faster 
than scientists even expected. Um, and yet nobody's willing to actually say that. And that's really the first step towards uh, making change and aligning our priorities. Our second demand is act now. So we demand net zero emissions by 2025. Why 2025? Didn't the IPCC recommend net zero by 2050? The Paris Accord of 2015 revolves around this idea that if the world can get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, that will keep global temperature increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's supposedly a safe increase and allows us to avoid catastrophe. But what they don't put in the headlines is that probability, the probability of that working, that net zero by 2050 will actually keep us under 1.5 degrees Celsius is 50%. So just think about it, like, would you cross a street with a 50-50 chance of survival? It's, it's a metric that doesn't make sense. And so we need to like really move up our timeline. And a lot of people ask, isn't net zero 2025 politically unrealistic? Um, well, physics doesn't really care about politics and, and what is pragmatic in the political sense. 2025 is the prudent net zero target to protect earth and its inhabitants and uh, we're guided by the science. Our third demand is beyond politics. Ooh. So our current democratic structures have failed us. They are corrupted by money, they're corrupted by unrepresentative structures like the Electoral College and first past the post elections, by bills that are so complex that the legislators don't even really understand them. So we really need to reinvent politics we're calling for citizens' assemblies to decide on the critical questions of the day. Citizens' assemblies, they're kind of like a jury for policy. They gather representative, they gather a representative section of the population, so representative by age, race, gender, income, and they bring experts and stakeholders to talk to that cross-section of the population so that they can make an informed decision about what policies to pass. There are really good examples of this from uh, places like Ireland, where they legalized abortion because of a citizens assembly. It was this totally politically toxic topic. But when you had actual citizens in the room making the decisions, they went with the most progressive option. And that happens time and time again. It happened in Paris too, with the climate citizens assemblies, a um, little bit more complicated. But what we find is that citizens tend to be much more progressive and much quicker moving and more reactive uh, than politicians. If we had a cross-section of the population in New York in a citizens' assemblies, um, what that would look like is having a group of people who are deciding on legislation that is 68% from racially and ethnically diverse populations, 50% from households earning less than $67,000 a year, and 48% speaking a language other than English at home. And of course, of that group, the top 1% of, er of earners in New York would only get 1% of re the representation. So, I mean, that's that would create pretty radical change. That's a pretty radical model based, uh, you know, compared to what we have today. Tackling the climate crisis will require enormous changes to society, which will provoke enormous resistance. And those changes can't be forced top down. The only way we can get to it is, uh, by directly involving people in the decision-making process. That's how you get people to buy in. And we can do that via citizens' assemblies. Part of the reason that you know the, the abortion bill in Ireland was so successful was the, the huge amount of media coverage that citizens' assemblies got. So um, feel free to check that out online. Our fourth demand is a just transition. So if you go on the Extinction Rebellion website, there's an, there's a, an explanation there. It's kind of long. Um, but here's, you know, some of the nuance of it. There are different ways that different under people understand what just transition means, what a just transition means. Some people in the United States understand it as a way for fossil fuel workers to transition to jobs in renewables industries. Some people understand it as protecting historically marginalized and impacted populations of the U.S. Unfortunately, these positions often neglect to take into account the negative impacts of such policies outside of the rich global north. That renewables may have a negative impact on mining communities in Africa, for example. Um, people don't always take that into consideration. So our understanding of just transition is, is a lot more expansive and you can get more details about that on our website.
So based on those demands, how are we going to take that and achieve actual systemic change? So we call attention to our demands like citizens' assemblies and a just transition by all peaceful means possible. During some of our actions, we engage in peaceful acts of civil disobedience to push governments and corporations to address climate issues. Our tactics are, are disruptive, but they're strictly nonviolent. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about what that means um, to use nonviolent civil disobedience as a strategy. It's something that has a really rich history and it goes back for centuries. It's been used as a weapon against oppressive regimes, discriminatory laws, social injustices. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi's salt march in India played a pivotal role in the fight for independence. And the civil rights movement in the United States, um, where figures like Martin Luther King Jr. led massive nonviolent protests to challenge segregation and discrimination. So we use nonviolent civil disobedience because really time is up. We have to do what works and civil disobedience works. We've seen that time and time again. When nothing else seems to work, when dialogue and negotiation have hit the wall, it's usually the last resort. And we believe that with the urgency of climate change, we can't just shy away from an unconventional methods to bring about the necessary transformation. It's important to note that nonviolent civil disobedience has rarely been popular when initially undertaken. It challenges the status quo and disrupts the comfortable routines of society. And those who engage in it often face criticism and sometimes even persecution to varying levels. Um, but it's that discomfort that can lead to change. There was this study that came out, or this, this piece came out, and I think it was in The Guardian maybe last year. Um, and they interviewed between one and 200 historians of social change, like political scientists and historians. And across the board, they said that the most important factor to achieving the goal of a, of a movement for social change was the use of disruption. Um, and so, you know, even the, even the sort of crazy zany ways that we implement nonviolent civil disobedience to disrupt people's daily lives and to disrupt the public, to disrupt, you know, outside of corporations or, or government offices, um, we do that because it works and because it's worked over and over again. That being said, doing things that are going to get you arrested isn't the only way to take part in the movement. Um, I personally have not been arrested. Most of the people that I work with in XR have, um, but I, I haven't gotten there yet. Um, so we'll talk about some other ways that you can get involved later. Uh, but first, I'll show you a couple ways that we have been disrupting recently. On September 7th, uh, activists from Extinction Rebellion New York disrupted the U.S. Open, and uh, they disrupted play in the game for about 50 minutes. They paused the game, to the game for about 50 minutes and warned that there's no tennis on a dead planet, demanded an end to fossil fuels. So one quote that came out of that was from um, the activist who actually succeeded in, in stopping the game for 50 minutes. His name is Shy Oak. And he said, we're not pro protesting the event itself. We're not protesting tennis. We're not protesting the emissions that brought spectators to get here. That's not the point. We are here because we have to disrupt this public event as our last resort to draw public attention to the climate emergency we are facing today. And as we know, you know, drawing that public attention works. Uh, another quote from that, um, from one of our spokespeople, Miles Grant. Miles said, the climate is already more disruptive than any activists can, can possibly be. Just look at the U.S. Tennis Open and other big tennis events. Year after year, the average temperatures have been rising, making it hotter and more dangerous for the players and spectators. At some point, there will be fewer outdoor sporting events due to excessive heat. Um, I was there for this. I was on. I was sort of waiting outside to, to, for jail support when 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 you know the activists inside got arrested, and it, it was probably one of the most exhilarating parts of my um, membership in XR. We were sitting out there in the car waiting, watching the tennis game on someone's iPhone. <laughs> um, and at some point I just saw Shy Oak, my friend, you know, with his feet glued to the floor, standing up and shouting and stopping the game. I was scrolling through Twitter. I was looking at everybody's reactions. Um, there was a wide range of reactions, but it just, it got so much attention that I felt like I was in the heart of it. Um, and so that was really, I, I don't know, that was that was a, just such an exciting night for me. And it, it got an immense amount of media coverage. We got covered by the New York Times for the first time in years. So another one was No Fashion on a Dead Planet. That was on uh, September 13th. 
a couple of years ago. No, no, September 5th, 13th, and 2023. And um, so four naked activists from Extinction Rebellion took their No Fashion on a Dead Planet message to New York Fashion Week, um, the Blondes runway show, to amplify the urgent need for action on the climate crisis. Protesters were draped in banners reading Tell the Naked Truth about the climate crisis, and they de demanded an end to the use of fossil fuels. Those activists stayed silent, they had their mouths covered in tape, and they stood in sol solidarity with those impacted by the flooding in Libya, the wildfires in Maui, and all other communities who were already suffering as a result of the climate crisis. Um, here are some quotes from that. The naked truth is, nature is the main fashion victim in 2023. If we do not want to abandon humanity and the natural world, we must end fossil fuels now. After all, there is no fashion on a dead planet. Here's another one. India, Bangladesh, China, Pakistan, and many other countries where child labor and the clothing and textile production is reported are, are, are already among the most affected by the climate emergency. While flexing in unnecessary clothes, we are accelerating the process that will result in 1 billion climate refugees by 2050. And the last one. New York Fashion Week has long grappled with, the, with matching the prominence of its European counterparts, falling short each year. Why not pivot to spotlighting the intersection of climate and fashion? By doing so, it could rise as the most forward-thinking event globally. It's high time designers and executives reflect deeply on their roles within the environmental and human supply chain, striving to minimize harm. Here's one, no luxury emissions on a dead planet. I, I really like this one. I wish I'd been there. I'm kind of jealous. Um, so on September 13th of 2023, activists from Extinction Rebellion disrupted private helicopter takeoffs at JRA West 30th Street Heliport Airport, and they disrupted flights the same way that severe storms would. So they warned that there are no luxury emissions on a dead planet. They demanded an end to fossil fuels and with baby strollers and soft toys, blocked the main entrance using lock-ons and they held banners with the words, luxury emissions destroy futures. Um, I'll just read you one quote from that. Helicopters are a pestilence to New Yorkers and a rotten pinnacle of an economic system that places pleasure over planetary survival. We must stop them. And that comes from Charles Komanoff, who's a bicycle activist and a transportation analyst. Here's one that you may have seen. Um, this is by Extinction Rebellion activists who uh, went to Burning Man and were in the meantime beaten up by Nevada Rangers while they were trying to draw the attention of people at Burning Man to capitalism's failure on climate issues. So why, I mean, why address this to Burning Man? Burning Man was born out of deep understanding for the world, uh, born out of a deep understanding of the world's flaws. For years, it's shown the power of community and declared challenging the norm. Today's norm is climate and ecological breakdown. So it's about time to turn Burning Man's vision into reality. The method that they used was a traffic blockade into Burning Man on the event's first day, open to the general public. The group blocked a main thoroughfare using a trailer, lock-ons, and banners with the words Burners of the World Unite, Abolish Capitalism, and General Strike for Climate. The purpose of the blockade was to draw attention to capitalism's inability to address climate and ecological breakdown. It's also in protest against the popularization of Burning Man among affluent people who do not live the stated values of Burning Man resulting in the commodification of the event. The theme that year was animalia. Uh, and so, you know, while we creatively recognize and celebrate the animal kingdom, we have to acknowledge that it has declined by almost 70% since 1970 due to human consumer driven, consumer -driven activity. Here's one, Free the Degatu, um, one at the Met, and that was about supporting two activists um, who faced disproportionately brutal sentences in court um, for splashing paint or for, uh, for, for, you know, allegedly damaging art when that's not actually what they did at all. Um, so that was, this protest was on July 8th. And about 40 climate activists from Extinction, Rebellion, from Extinction Rebellion and Rise and Resist shut down over eight exhibits at the Met. And that marked a second protest at the Met in a span of two weeks, provoked by the extremely excessive charges pressed against Joanna Smith and Tim Martin, 
referred to as the Degatu, both of whom were members of the climate group Declare Emergency for their symbolic and nonviolent action at the National Gallery of Art on April 27, 2023. It's important to note that no direct damage to the artwork occurred or was attempted by either of them, and the estimated total damage to the Degas installation amounts to only $2,400. So after this whole wave of climate protests that happened in museums that I'm sure you saw on the news and I'm sure you've talked about with people in your day-to-day -day life, um, Extinction Rebellion opted, opted for a shift in, in our approach. So um, groups sat silently in front of multiple artworks throughout the Met. They held signs with messages like no art on a dead planet, no fashion on a dead planet. And most importantly, they refrained from touching any art pieces. That change aimed to challenge the negative public discourse in which climate activists have been accused of attacking irreplaceable artwork to underscore the pressing need for immediate action in addressing the climate and ecological crisis. And um, here's the, I'll just show you two more. So here's one that was for shutting down MoMA and 16 climate activists were arrested during this one. Um, that was because they attempted an overnight occupation of MoMA in protest to the museum's ties to uh, a fossil fuel billionaire. And then the bank takeover um, for that, our message there was no new oil. Um, Activists sprayed no new oil, hashtag no new oil, and climate criminals at branches of City, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. Um, and that was following a really extremely disappointing annual general meeting of shareholders. So it's it's really not enough for them to have those those meetings and you know work in a green building or invest in renewables if they're still financing new coal, oil, and gas projects. And they put you know, cumulatively billions, if not trillions of dollars into those projects every year. Continuing with business as usual poses significant risks to future generations and the International Energy Agency, and you know, they're, you know, not, not as radical as we are, states that launching new coal, oil, and gas extraction projects is necessary, is, is necessary to avoid catastrophic consequences. So, Today, big money has demonstrated that they prioritize profits over life on Earth and that there is no money on a dead planet. So now we'll talk a little bit about what exactly makes Extinction Rebellion different. We know that there's a ton of other organizations out there. We all exist within this ecosystem of groups that are trying to prevent climate change. Um, so the things that really make us different are one, we don't have a policy prescription. And two, we have a self-organizing system. We talked about no policy prescription before um, when we talked about citizens' assemblies. So our self-organizing system, here's how it works. It's completely non-hierarchical and work happens within working groups or circles. And each of those circles works autonomously. Um, each circle's mandate defines the boundaries of what they can do. So within each working group or within each circle, um, every, per, every, every member is expected to fill a particular role and they're accepted into that working group on the, on the promise that they will fulfill that role. So in outreach, for example, we have one person who is our financial liaison and they basically keep track of how much money we have to spend on events and on flyers and stuff. That's their role. Uh, we have someone else who is our facilitator and they run you know that and that's me and I run the weekly meetings we have someone who's our regenerative culture advocate who makes sure that people feel like they you know that people aren't getting mired in interpersonal conflicts and that people uh, are connecting and building community just as much as they're doing the work on the ground working group meetings work most efficiently when work happens on the basis of proposals so someone brings a proposal to the working group the working group listens to, understands, comments on, and accepts or rejects the proposal. And there's room for brainstorming, but usually that happens asynchronously or, you know, with a couple people outside of the working group meeting. And then after their brainstorming, they bring a product to that meeting. So proposals are passed by unanimous consent, and any member of a working group can stop a proposal. The, a lot of people hear that and they think, oh, so you get nothing done. Um, it sounds like a recipe for deadlock. But really, the way that we do it is that consent 
is given on the basis of a pretty low bar. So it's not that you're consenting because you think the proposal is perfect and it's exactly what you want to do. You consent if it's good enough for now and safe enough to try. Only active members of a working group who actually fulfill roles are part of the consent process. And you don't get a vote just by showing up for meetings and sort of talking about your opinions. You get a vote by doing the work. You, you get a vote because you're fulfilling a particular role that the working group needs you to fulfill. And so I was, I was kind of skip, skeptical of the consent process at first, but in my past year of being in Extinction Rebellion, it's pretty rare that we reach an impasse of someone just totally holding up a proposal because they just don't really like it or, you know, they're not willing to try it out. Um, because working groups are made out of people who really actually want to get things done. And so when you bring all those people in a room together, um, you know, deadlock is just far less likely, especially if they're actually abiding by this principle of good enough for now, safe enough to try. So you can see on here, my circle is outreach. So it's down in the lower right-hand corner and has all those circles branching out from it. And if you take my own involvement in outreach as an example, um, the way that a proposal could work is I would go to our, our Monday meeting and I would say, hey guys, I've been thinking about this and I really think that we need to target the college, that we need to target college students. Um, and I have this university in mind. I think that we should go there. I think we should set up our table with a sign up sheet and that we should have pizza because college students love pizza. And we should bring a bunch of like secondhand clothes and we'll set up like a little thrift store type thing. We'll put them on racks like people do. We'll set up secondhand clothes shop, pizza, sign up table. We'll hand people flyers. We'll talk to them as they come by. We'll give them little XR buttons. Um, we'll draw them in with the free food and with the thrifting because college students love thr thrifting and environmentalists love thrifting. And then we'll get them to sign up for Extinction Rebellion and tell them a little bit about what we're about. Then afterwards, I'm going to need the onboarding and integration team to call all the people who signed up, talk to them about their place in the movement and get them integrated. So that's my proposal. I just I would probably I would maybe write that out to, you know, make it more clear and send it out to my group, to the to the signal group chat, you know, before we had our meeting so people could look it over. But that would be my proposal. Then we would go around the circle and every consenting member would ask any clarifying questions they have. So like one person may ask me, um, well, how many people are going to man the table because, um, and then how many people are going to fly or just so we know how much manpower we're going to need for this. And I'm like, ah, maybe we'll have two people sit at the table. We'll do shifts of like an hour and a half or two hours. And then one person handing out flyers nearby. I'd be like, okay, that makes sense. Then everybody asks their clarifying questions. Then we go around and everybody shares their reactions. Someone might say, well, why are we making this into like a thrifting event? So that's not really what Extinction Rebellion does. We're like, we do nonviolent direct action. We're more hardcore than like thrifting. That doesn't make sense. And I would say, yeah, okay, I hear that. But that's really just a way to like draw people in. Um, it's a way to get college students' attention. So let's like, what if we just tried it and see if, saw, see if it works? Because maybe that'll get people to come and sign up for Extinction Rebellion and hear what we have to say. And then they'll come to an orientation call like this. And if they don't like it, then they won't join and it is what it is. So then after that, you do a whole round, you say, everybody says whether or not they consent to the, to the proposal. If everybody thinks it's good enough for now, safe enough to try, it's stamp of approval and you get going. So here's a list of our principles and values. Um, I'm just gonna, so I'll read them all. Um, we have a shared vision of change. We set our mission on what is necessary. We need a regenerative culture. We openly challenge ourselves and our toxic system. We value reflecting and learning. We welcome everyone and every part of everyone. We actively mitigate for power. We avoid blaming and shaming. We're a nonviolent network and we're based on autonomy and decentralization. Um, I like a lot of these, but my main ones, my top three, I, I really like we set our mission on what is necessary. Um, I think being led by the science leads to the most radical actions. Um, we're not being led by what people are most comfortable by. We're being led by what is actually going to save lives. And um, that's, yeah, that's really important to me. We openly challenge ourselves and our toxic system. Um, I love that one. To me, it kind of goes hand in hand with we value reflecting and learning where we challenge ourselves, we reflect, we learn, and we adapt. And I know that 
coming into Extinct Extinction Rebellion, I was kind of afraid to get involved with a bunch of activists who are really hardcore about what they're doing because I'm extremely uncomfortable with conflict and I really I really want people to like me and I was like oh I'm gonna get in arguments and about our strategy and whatever and and I was I was kind of afraid of that um I'm from the midwest like I can't I can't help it I don't love conflict um and I didn't really know how to deal with it but then since being an extinction rebellion I've just learned how to have conflict with people on the basis of mutual respect and understanding that we're on the same team and I'm really I'm not afraid anymore to just say if I don't like an idea and I know how to do it respectfully like I respect everyone in outreach and I, I don't want to make them feel stupid but um but I'm willing to disagree with people's ideas and I'm I'm much more comfortable with people disagreeing my ideas than I was before and the whole idea of reflecting and learning I, I feel like extinction rebellions self-organizing system is so flexible like our mandates every every circle has a mandate that they abide by it sort of defines what they're able to do but in outreach we just revised like three or four of our sub circles mandates because just the times are changing we have a different amount of resources than we did two years ago we have different strategy goals than we did two years ago so now different subgroups need to do different things so um i just love that we can be light on our feet that we can adapt to change and that we can really reflect on what works and what doesn't So now we've gotten to, um, we're, we're, we're getting close to the end. Um, and I wanna say that getting arrested, taking part in nonviolent direct action isn't the only way you can get involved in Extinction Rebellion. Like I've said multiple times throughout this, mainly what I do is talk to people about climate change and talk to them about what they can do to stop it. Um, I also spend a lot of time brainstorming people the best way to do that. Like not everything you have to do has to be out on the street, but if you want, everything you can you, you do can be out on the street. If all you want to do is flyer, all you want to do is get to actions, all you want to do is like be at mobilizations, that's also amazing and that's how you can spend your time. Um, the best way to join is just to go to a working group meeting, see how it works, see if it jives with the skills that you have and jives with what you want to contribute to the movement. Um, and then really just give your energy and your labor to that working group. That's We need that more than anything. Um, we probably even need that more than we need people who are getting, who are willing to get arrested. So this is the end. Um, here are some references for how you can really get involved. And I'll show you, um, I know you can't click on any of these links, but if you go to our website, you just have to go to xrr.nyc. And where that's going to take you is to our main page. And then from our main page, you can go to join us up at the top here. So if you go to join us, it'll bring you here. You can subscribe to our emails. Um, and if you're ready to get going, you can, and you haven't yet, you can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one integration call, which is a really amazing way to get to know where, where we need people in the movement and where you, what kind of working groups are meeting this week, you know, what you can do to get involved, where you can actually like go and uh, the tasks you can start taking on. You can also go up here and go to our events, and that's going to list a bunch of other ways you can get involved. It'll say where we're flyering, when's our, when our next actions are, um, just, you know, when our trainings are, all of that. Yeah, here we have flyering, we have introduction to self-organizing systems, um, but you're an expert on that now. So yeah, any of that. All of that is a great way to get involved. Um, and from there, you can, once you, especially once you get in an integration call, you can get tuned into our announcements and discussions, chats, and from there, figure out how you can get further involved in Extinction Rebellion. Yeah, so thank you all so much for watching today, and um, I really hope to see you out there.